Well, um, I read this paper. Uh, so first of all, uh, hi, I'm Philip. Uh, nice one. Uh, thanks for having me. Nice to be here. Um, I recently read this paper um, called Ghosts of Departed Proofs by uh, Matt Noonan. Uh, and I found it so interesting. I wanted to talk about, about it to someone. Um, I, I apologize in advance. Uh, I have a lot of code uh, on my, in my presentation. But uh, really, it's, it's not that much code. Modulo variations of the same code uh, again and again. A lot of variations of the same code. So um, I, uh, I work uh, as I have a student job uh, programming Haskell. And I, uh, I kept running into, into a problem. And I like this paper so much. Uh, because it uh, very clearly spells out this problem uh, and shows how you can solve it in some cases. Um, and um, Richard Eisenberg uh, has been uh, here giving a talk uh, some time ago, and he mentioned as a side note some of the work he's currently doing. And uh, this work that he's doing has the potential to make this technique that Mark Noonan describes uh, a lot more ergonomic. So. Uh, there is a chance that, the, that there's a trend that this will be used more in the future. Uh, the slides are online. Um, I'll try to put that in the chat. Uh, but I don't really see the chat. So I think... You can also send them to me later and I'll make sure they get distributed. Mm, fine. Yeah, uh, let's do that then. Um, and the, the, the complete exam code of these slides is also online um, on GitLab. So expanded return type, whatever that is. Uh, so what is the problem that I was talking about that this paper addresses? Um, consider you're writing a library and you want to provide a, a map type. So a dictionary of keys and values, uh, just like the containers package uh, on Hackage. Uh, and you would um, provide a function uh, that uh, is called lookup, and um, you can use it to um, give it a key, give it your dictionary, uh, your map, uh, and receive the value if it is in the map. So this is an example of a function that requires a precondition, as it's stated here in its uh, specification. And the potential or the possibility of this pro, um, precondition being violated is um, expressed uh, in the return type by using a maybe. Uh, this is very common in the, in the Hustle community um, and is considered to, to improve um, type safety or, or um, robustness of the code base. Um, but uh, as the, the paper of Matt Noonan um, shows, uh, this can become problematic. Uh, another function uh, down here in this uh, interface of this library that you might be uh, writing um, is uh, a function called member, which checks the precondition. So you can use this um, function to check the precondition of the other function. Uh, let's look at some uh, code that a user of this library might write. So uh, I have a, a few different uh, modules here, and um, maybe it might help you um, that the, the name of the file is always uh, at the top of the code snippet. Uh, so that might help you uh, not uh, lose the overview. So let's assume you, you write an application and you have one data type to um, encode all the things that could go wrong in your application, uh, an app error. Uh, one of these things could be um, that the, there's a, the, 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 you're trying to do a lookup with an invalid key uh, and uh, some other problems. Just imagine the arbitrary more constructors here. And you might want to write a function um, that you use to validate something. So um, you, in this case, you because later you want to uh, look up a key in the map, um, you're writing a function that takes a key, which is always an integer in our example, and a map. And um, in the case that the validation goes wrong, you will, this function will know uh, that it has to return an app error. So one of your um, uh, constructors of this uh, data type to signal that something went wrong in our application. And uh, this is uh, using just a normal 
um, containers package API um, doing the member check and uh, depending on the outcome, either returning the appropriate error or returning a nothing to signal that uh, the validation succeeded. And then you would uh, write another function which uses your validation function. So first thing the function does, it validates its inputs and um, handles the, the error case. Um, that is that is good. Um, but if the validation succeeds, so there's uh, no error returned, uh, we want to use the, the value in the map and we do the lookup. Um, we use the result and we also have this possibility of the lookup returning a nothing. We cannot handle this um, chance of a violated precondition, this possibility, because we know that it cannot occur. So there's no reasonable way to handle it. And indeed, there's no reasonable to, way to do anything because we, we neither have the result, nor do we have the, the error type, um, the error value. So uh, we just use error here. Now, there's a few problems with this, um, this code. First of all, uh, using the uh, nothing to propagate exceptional situations um, does not contain a lot of information. And if you do it a lot and you propagate um, this um, maybe value up multiple levels in the call tree, you uh, might lose the information which exact um, function had which exact exceptional situation. So you might want to fix this by um, using an either type but then you would um, you might run into the problem that if you have either's and the left um, types uh, are of different types, um, then you cannot monadically compose them. Um, Matt Parsons has described this very uh, very nicely in his blog post. The trouble with typed errors it's, it's one of his uh, most popular ones. Um, and I really like this this blog post. Uh, so basically, uh, you don't um, you cannot really have checked exceptions. Uh, representing them by either's. Anyway, and that's not the biggest problem here. Another problem here is that um, you you validate the, the the combination of map and key, and um, perform this check if the key is in the map. But then also you call the um, the function, and then this function internally might again have to do the same validation. So it has again to check the precondition, although it has already been checked. Um, is this really a problem in this case? Um, it's a weakness of this example uh, that this is not a problem in this case, probably at least, because it's, uh, it's hard to imagine how you would implement this lookup function without automatically uh, having to check if the, the key is indeed in, in the map. Um, it's a, this is a weakness of this example. Um, in the most cases where you can apply Matt Noonan's technique, um, it is indeed the, the problem that is uh, the, the biggest problem that you solve by, by doing that is that you have to um, apply a check multiple times redundantly. You have to uh, do the, either an expensive check redundantly or an, a check that uh, involves IO uh, redundantly, which is uh, always not very nice. Uh, so in this example, the biggest problem with this is that by putting the error here, uh, we, we introduce a, a great source of brittleness um, into this code base. Uh, it's basically a bug waiting to happen because this function, the validating function, might be very far away and at some time might be updated not to do this check properly uh, anymore, either intentionally or unintentionally. And then it's very easy to forget that uh, you have this, um, this assumption here, uh, assuming that uh, this cannot happen. And then you would uh, end up with a runtime error, which is of course very bad. So um, one more thing, um, this approach uh, is basically expanding the return type by uh, the nothing value. So it, it um, represents the possibility of a runtime, uh, um, a precondition violation by um, adding another value to the return type. So that's why I call this approach expanded return type uh, and uh, suffix this file name or this module name with the expand word. Um, and Matt Noonan uh, wants to contrast this with the, so this uh, wants to contrast the approach of the expanded return type with the approach of an restri restricted argument types. Uh, you find this contrast of these two approaches uh, in a few blog posts. Uh, for example, um, many might know the pass don't validate by Alexis King or 
uh, these um, two to um, blog posts uh, by Matt Parsons. They all uh, involve the same contrast between these two approaches. Uh, so let's look at the first attempt of um, restricting the argument types. I have a question at this point. Um, how many of you uh, know uh, what is going to happen next? Uh, either because you already uh, know the, the library called Justified Containers by um, Matt Noonan, or because you know the, the paper, Ghost of Departed Proofs, or for some other reason you know what is going to happen next. Uh, I don't expect you to know it, but uh, just so I know uh, what to focus on. Uh, could you give me a yes or no? Are you watching the chat? Uh, yes, I am. I, I mean, oh, no, not the chat, just the, the participants. Uh, I have one yes and then a bunch of no's. Okay, all right. Uh, and a bit. Someone says a bit. Okay, okay. Then I, uh, I think I just do it. Um, I just uh, focus on, on Matt Noonan's uh, ideas here. Uh, so Matt Noonan's first key idea is to, uh, let's, let's back up for a second. Um, the, the key problem here, um, when we want to um, restrict the argument types instead of expanding the return type, is that we would need to express a precondition on the type level, uh, which involves two arguments. So two term level arguments uh, have to be somehow related on the type level. And uh, the key idea of Martin Noonan, what the first key idea of Martin Noonan um, to achieve this is to wrap term level values into um, a phantom type with an additional type level variable. And this variable will be used to refer to the term level variable. And uh, because we use it to refer to something, uh, Matt Noonan calls it a name. Uh, and of course, uh, um, by the way, this is in its, uh, in its own module um, because this is our first attempt. Uh, it's called named first. Um, and there, there are functions to wrap it and to unwrap it, forget name. Uh, and here's an example of how, what I mean by saying we use these um, type variables to refer to, to, refer to term level variables. Um, this data type uh, in our library, so we're still writing a library and uh, we have a, our own uh, data type now, which does not carry any runtime, uh, carry any runtime information, but at compile time, we use it to refer to a key and a map and we use it to um, make the statement and to guarantee the statement that some key is in some map. Uh, we'll later see exactly uh, which key and which map. Um, these variables uh, will be used to refer to, to term level um, keys and term level maps via this uh, phantom wrapper, phantom type wrapper. Uh, and the guarantee is whenever this is in scope, whenever a value of this is in scope, then uh, we know that um, some key is in some map and we know exactly which key in which map. So how can uh, such um, a type make this kind of guarantee? The answer is that if the user ever wants to obtain such a type and therefore get it into scope, um, it has the, the user has to, to use this library function member. And this function returns the, the user of the library um, uh, a value of this type, or maybe it doesn't return anything um, because it, uh, it first performs a check. So uh, the user wants to obtain this, um, this proof. Uh, you can interpret this uh, uh, value of this type as a proof of the fact that some key is in some map. And if the user wants this, he has to call this function with a key and a map and the library will perform the check and only if the key is indeed in the map, it will return the member type value. Um, and here you can see how the, the named phantom wrapper is used to uh, refer to, to create a type level name for term level values. So uh, this is the, the, the connection here is done uh, through these type variables. Uh, they have to be the same. Uh, and be, 
this way um, the type it's it's basically um, represented in the type level does that uh, this proof refers to this key and this map. So, um, and now basically we have uh, represented the, the post condition of the member function in its type, through its type. So the post condition is that uh, if that um, the, the key is in the, in the map and um, this represents that. And now we can try to express the precondition of the lookup function through its type in turn. And uh, we do that here by uh, again, asking for wrapped values. Uh, so they have to be named so we can refer to them on the type level, uh, a key and a map. And also in addition, uh, we require a proof that this key is in this map. And then we don't return a maybe anymore, but we just return a value immediately. Uh, we can do that because the, the user can only provide us with this proof if he has called the maybe function previously. The maybe function can fabricate this proof out of thin air, as you can see here, but the user cannot do that because uh, the, the, the constructor is not exported. So the user has to use the member function. And uh, we could also imagine that internally, this function now does not have to perform the check anymore if the uh, key was in the map, because it's already guaranteed that the user performed this check before through the member function. But uh, of course, the, this particular example of a lookup function of a map, um, you cannot implement it without performing the check automatically, I believe. So what would the user code look like now uh, if, if the user was using this? Uh, this is uh, the same, um, roughly the same code as before. Um, it's the validate function and the process function as before. Uh, the difference is now that the, the validate uh, function accepts um, named arguments, unlike before. And before we, in the case of the validation failing, we returned uh, an error. And if it uh, succeeded, we didn't return anything. But um, in this case, we still return the error if we fail, but if we succeed, we return proof of the fact that we succeeded. So the, the difference is, is here. Um, the process function, um, just like before, calls the validation function to validate. But now instead of matching on a maybe, it matches on an either. And um, just like before, it uh, just prints the error if it occurs. But unlike before, if the validation succeeds, we get a proof, a type level proof, and the lookup function does not return a maybe anymore. So we don't have to uh, use this error um, a call. Let's see. So that was the, um, the, the key idea of, uh, of Mark Noonan. Uh, I'm basically out of time right now, although I, I could, uh, um, you know, continue a lot more. You can take some more time if you want, and then I'll invite people to think of questions while you're doing that. No problem. That's that's really great. Uh, at this point, uh, totally interrupt me if I'm talking too long, because uh, I don't know how much time. <laughs> I don't know. You're time. you're you're fine. Okay. So uh, this is this is really great um, because it's not so br it's not brittle anymore. We're not we're not. There's no risk of running into the runtime error. Um, because we're not calling error anymore. Um, and if, if the um, validate function is changed and uh, does not does its validation properly anymore, uh, we will get, we will uh, hope for that we get a type error. At least that's the idea. Um, the problem is it doesn't work. Uh, there still needs a slight modification. So uh, second attempt, as restricted argument type. Let's try to, to trick this, this library and do something that should uh, generate a compile time error. So um, I've just slightly modified the, the example um, by introducing this new key. So uh, in addition to the key that we're passed uh, and that we're supposed to use, we just have another key. It's ju we just use the zero key. Um, and let's um, assume the zero key is in this map. 
uh, but this key is not actually in this map. Uh, and because we're using the key to perform the lookup here, uh, this, this would fail at runtime unless we get a compile time error. Uh, so do we get a compile time error? Well, actually it, at runtime, it should already, um, the validation should already fail, but here's the trick. Uh, I don't um, do the validation properly because I pass the zero key to the map and, and to the validation instead of passing the actual key that I will later perform the lookup with. So we would hope for a, a compile time error, a type error, that's the whole point after all, um, because uh, we could think that uh, the, clearly the lookup function would expect the proof to refer to this key, key named. Uh, so basically through this type variable. Uh, and when we do the validation, uh, the only way to get uh, a proof referring to this typed variable is by supplying the proper argument. As you can see here, these uh, two um, variables are the same. But we, we use the wrong argument. Uh, the, the type variable of this argument, the name of this argument is zero name. So the, the compiler or the type checker would uh, attempt to, to unify this type variable with this type variable. So surely that's an error, right? And uh, an error is what we want um, because we're using the, the interface wrong. But it's not an error. Um, why is that not an error? The answer is this is not an error for the same reason that this is not an error. If we just have a list with a variable, with a type variable, uh, and we have another list with a different type variable, and we can freely assign this list to the other list because uh, these type variables are universally quantified. So they unify uh, just as well as we could, um, we could um, assign this list to a bool list because we, may, we can make arbitrary assumptions about this type variable. Let's look at a different situation, a slight modification of this uh, example, of this well-typed example. Uh, let's look at an ill-type um, variation of this. If this list was a function parameter in this case, and we would try the exact same thing to assign it, basically to assume that this uh, could be a bool. If we were to do that, are we allowed to do that? We're not allowed to do that because now it's, uh, it's in, the, in the argument position and the caller of this function could choose to instantiate these type variables to whatever he wants. So we are not allowed to make any assumptions about this. So let's look at, uh, at the, the map uh, code again. Um, so in this case here in the validate function, we are in a very similar situation. Indeed, in this code, we are not allowed to make any assumptions about uh, the key name or the map name, uh, these type variables, because again, they're in an argument position and the caller of this function um, could instantiate these um, type variables to whatever he wishes or they wish. So how do we consistently force a user of this library into this kind of situation uh, and prevent this kind of situation where uh, the user of the library has a universally quantified variable, which you can make any arbitrary assumption about. So this is the answer. And this is the, the second key idea of uh, Matt Noonan. And um, you might remember previously that the, uh, the, uh, the name function uh, basically asked for a value a and it would return you a named a. So it says, give me an a, I will give you a named a. Uh, now, the situation is different. It still asks for an a. So this time it's saying, give me an a and give me, and basically tell me what you would do with a named a if you had a named a. And then I will go ahead and do that for you and uh, return you the result of that. So this is obviously forcing the, the library user into the situation of 
the named value being in an argument position. So how would that look like now if uh, we were, were to try the, if we were to write the code uh, and use this library? The, the rest of the library does not change and the validation function does not change either. Unsurprisingly, because we just, uh, the goal here was to force the library user to always be in this kind of situation. So what changes is the process function. And um, now to, to get the named, uh, to wrap our arguments into uh, a name type, we have to use the name function. Um, but unlike before, well, we, we also had to do that before, but unlike before now, we don't just get a value back, but we have to, as a second argument, provide a function telling what we would do with the, the named value. Uh, and the, the, the function um, receives this named value as an argument. And this is what this is doing, um, but you can almost read it a bit like a binding uh, a value to, 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 uh, to an identifier. So once again, we are taking the key argument and we're taking the map argument and we are wrapping them uh, and, uh, use, and binding them to, to a name and then using the, the library just like before. So this part down here is exactly as before. The only difference is that uh, instead of the name function returning as a value, we have to provide it with an additional function describing what we would do with the value that we previously got returned from it. Um, and in this case, if we uh, try again to trick the library, just like before, uh, we, we do the validation with the wrong key, we do the validation with a zero key, um, and then later try to do a lookup with, a, with the, the actual key that we were we were given. If we do that, now we do get the type error that we uh, that we wanted because um, we are trying to make assumptions about type variables that we're not allowed to do. Uh, here, once again, I used the it's it's basically the same code. I used the scope type variables uh, extension to um, to make explicit the type of this parameter of this argument. Uh, and as you can see, just before. Uh, this binder just refers to the to the the key wrapped in the named function type, and here you can see that uh, if we if we use the library incorrectly, we're basically trying to make assumptions about this type variable. Uh, we're we're trying to unify it with uh, with another type variable, and we're not allowed to do that because this is an argument uh, of a function that we are writing, and uh, we're not allowed to make assumptions about type variables. Uh, which occur in the arguments of the functions that we're writing. All right. Um, so this was uh, the two important key ideas of Matt Noonan. Uh, this is another point where I could uh, potentially potentially uh, finish my talk if, if you had enough of it. Uh, or I could, um, oh yeah, I could um, once again touch on the uh, what I said before about what Richard Eisenberg is working on at the moment. Because uh, what is a bit annoying about uh, this second key idea of Matt Noonan, uh, and, and which makes the whole approach a bit annoying, is that this type of the name function is, is really awkward. And um, it, it needs rank n types, and it's hard to understand. And it also makes the, so this is in the library, this is a library function. It also makes the user code uh, awkward um, because we, instead of just being returned the value and using let bindings, uh, we now have to pass a function uh, and use uh, lambda bindings. And uh, writing it this way makes it, um, makes it actually rather easy to understand. But then again, writing a, a lambda this way is, is in itself a bit weird because uh, we're constantly um, creating new lambdas, um, but not increasing the, the indentation or anything. So uh, this is the, uh, a big weak point of the, the approach by uh, that Matt Noonan um, came up with. And um, Richard Eisenberg, a core developer of GHC, um, is uh, currently working on a paper called Lightweight Existential Types. 
and uh, he he's uh, hoping to to submit it for the ICFP 2021. And um, the the goal of this is to to get an exists keyword uh, that syntactically works like a for keyword, uh, and that would um, make this um, Matt Noonan's approach uh, vastly more ergonomic. Uh, interestingly enough, this um, this this work is not motivated by by this ghosts of departed proofs technique, um, but by two other approaches of formal verification um, called uh, dependent Haskell and liquid Haskell. Uh, and he, he even hopes to, to have a new extension in GHC as soon. So once we have this exists keyword, the previously very complicated looking name function uh, would once again have a very simple type signature. So it doesn't um, doesn't um, have any of this continuation passing style anymore that we had before. All right. Um, so this is basically a, a, a way of um, formal verification, uh, a technique of formal verification, um, which is already possible with uh, Haskell and with very little um, extensions. So you don't need uh, dependent types or liquid Haskell uh, to to already um, achieve some some form of verification because we we are formally verifying the preconditions of library functions uh, that the, the the user code establishes and satisfies these so how does it compare with with a um, dependent Haskell or, or liquid Haskell for example so a big difference is that this approach as I as I told you as uh, as um, Matt Noonan came up with um, is only restricted to propositional logic, no predicate logic. So uh, the user can um, can if if uh, a library function um, provides a post condition to the user, and the user wants to use that um, for, to to satisfy a precondition or to prove that a precondition is satisfied for a different library function, um, and this post condition uh, is not directly the precondition of the next function. The user can actually do some some uh, uh, propositional logic to transform the the precondition into the the required postcondition. But we're limited to propositional logic here and not to predicate logic. Uh, so this um, basically means that we cannot the user cannot um, prove um, propositions about numbers or data structures, uh, and. Uh, that's basically the reason why for, for SMT-based formal verification, you use SMT solvers and not SAT solvers. Uh, and uh, this means that often it is not possible for a library author to export enough, uh, enough preconditions and enough postconditions um, to, to support all kinds of use cases. Um, the, this approach uh, by Matt Noonan, this ghost of departed proofs um, approach, requires uh, that the proofs are manually um, um, provided and manual and um, post conditions of library functions are manually um, transformed into preconditions of uh, other libr uh, library functions. And um, basically proofs has to be manually performed uh, similar to dependent types, uh, but completely unlike uh, SMT based verification, of course. And uh, library code in, in this uh, ghost of the proof, proofs technique uh, is not verified at all, of course, as we saw before. Uh, this is only a technique to, to make sure that you, the library user can, cannot use the, li the, the library wrong. But the, the, if, if the library author makes a mistake, it's not caught at all. Uh, I recommend that you, I, I really recommend uh, this blog post by uh, Oli Charles. Um, it, creates, uh, it contains a different and very great example, um, and uh, that's basically it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Philip, and thanks for the extra material as well. There is a, a question in the chat, and if anyone else has a question, please go ahead and type it now or just tell me that you have a question. Ulrich, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm already mentioned in chat. I, I guess I just, it's a little bit too above my head as a non-practical Haskeller. I just didn't get in the very first place what did uh, the the key problem is you're trying to solve actually with ah. the map. Um, 
Um, so my question was, how, where do you know uh, the, the exhaustive set of all the keys? I, it's somehow when you, you need to know that front, right? If I load the keys from a file, I'm stuck. Um, so you, you will need a library function that provides you with a post condition. So basically a library function that provides you with a proof and then later you can use that proof. So uh, one way to, to obtain this proof for the user of this library is to use a member function. So uh, in all the examples that I showed uh, so far, uh, basically the entire um, value of this verification is uh, to, to make sure that the user of the library calls a lookup function only after calling the member function. So this is what is um, now ensured on the type level. Uh, using this uh, technique, the, the type checker ensures that the user calls member before he calls the lookup function. So uh, in your case, if you put these values in, in a file and then later you use lookup uh, and you uh, use keys that you know are in the file because you put them there yourself, then obviously the type checker does not know that. And uh, there's no way to prove to the type checker yeah. uh, uh, this knowledge in your head. Um, but there's other uh, ways uh, you could uh, think of how, how the type checker might, um, how, you, how you might prove to the type checker that you, you, you are sure about the keys uh, other than the member function. For example, if you insert a key, uh, an insertion function would also be provided by the same library and uh, would also um, provide a, a post condition uh, and a proof uh, that you could later use when you do the lookup. Because if you insert something, uh, it's guaranteed that the key is in the map. Okay, thanks.